Hey, are you hungry? Yeah, yeah. You want to eat? Yeah. Everybody ready? Yeah, yeah. Let's get to work. My guest today gets to work eating all kinds of food, then writing about it, where it came from, and the geography that embraces it. Mix in some popular culture and a laid-back conversational style, and you have Foodigenous, a blog and social media phenomenon hatched by Adam Horvath, whose food pursuits in various past lives inform his passion for writing. Start with the bread, yeah, yeah. then add some jam. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget broccoli, yeah, yeah. and a touch of mayonnaise. Yeah. And Adam Horvath joins me right now from his palatial estate in Fanwood, New Jersey. Hello, Adam. Hello, Tom. How are you? And thank you for having me. I appreciate this. Absolutely. Adam is a blogger, as I mentioned in my little op- in my little open, uh, and he has a day job, which you know we all do, and we'll get to that in a minute. But Adam, the reason I'm fascinated by what you do, um, your blog, which by the way, folks, is called Foodigenous, not Indigenous, Foodigenous. Get into and, and that. Not- and not food genius, which a lot of my relatives still call it. Right. So well, when you first that. look at the word, you can, you're can you not quite sure what to make of it. But when you go to your website, you have a nice pronouncer there. But the reason I love your your um, your blog and the, the concept, you're basically doing the two things I love most in the world, which is writing and eating. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, notwithstanding the fact that I just had bariatric surgery to lose a bunch of weight because I've spent too much time eating over over my, my adult life mostly, uh, I love reading about food and I love cooking and uh, I love on you know eating and just basically relearning how to eat. But so tell me first of all what <clears throat> when you started the blog and why you decided to kind of combine you combine food and culture and a little bit of the stories behind the food and the places you go. Where did you, where did that bright idea come from? So I mean I loved food forever. Yeah, it says on my about that I. Uh... You know, I'm the combination of my my grandmother's chicken paprikash and, and Indiana Jones movies. And, and by Indiana Jones movies, I just watched a lot of movies and TV as a kid. And, uh, you know, I have a job. My regular job is that of a CFO. Not great title, but not sexy. Not what I thought that I'd be doing when I was you know, a teenager. I thought I was going to be writing movies. Before that, I thought I was going to be working as a stockbroker. But, I, you know, I, I thought I was going to be writing movies and then went to college, became an accountant. Um, have done a lot of restaurant work in my life, worked at the same pizzeria in my hometown for 10 years, paid for my college. What is your hometown, uh, by the way? I'm from Nekong, New Jersey. Ever oh, hear sure. of it? Yeah, of course. Represent. Um, you know, and then when I started to make the decision what I was going to do in my life, I made the decision to go left instead of right. And uh, I'm 47 years old now. And I look back every day and wonder what if. So, you know, I'll still run a shift every once in a while at the restaurant. They're like family to me and halfway through my legs hurt. I'm tired. I'm grumpy. And I kind of think I made the right decision. So So this this was a perfect opportunity. You mentioned that when you were a kid, you saw yourself writing movies. So did you write as a as a as a youth? I watched a lot of movies as a child. And then when I went to high school, you know, I wrote for the school newspaper. didn't write a lot, but, you know, I really watched a lot of TV, a lot of movies. If you read my blogs, I try and shoehorn as much pop culture in as possible. I started writing more when I went to college. I wrote for my college newspaper and I started writing short stories. Um, I also started writing scripts, but like little tiny short film came up during that era of Kevin Smith. He's a Jersey guy. So I'm like, you know, maybe that's a possibility. My college internship was for Robert De Niro. Tribeca, uh, Tribeca Film Productions, and I was the first ever accountant intern. But I just did it because I wanted to get in, and if I could, you know, meet people and and write, you know, maybe that was in. So, did you have any contact me. with the big guy? You know, I saw him. I saw him every mm. once in a while, but he was super shy. Mm. So his wife at the time, Grace, she, she was super nice. Chaz Palminteri had an office right next door to mine, and I would. uh I would be asked to watch his kid every once in a while, Dante, who I see on on Instagram now as like an adult, so it's kind of weird. But um, it was a great experience, and it kind of fooled me a little bit, thinking that's the route I was going to go. That's um, awesome. Well, that's amazing. So you do have writing chops. I mean, you didn't come to the blog just waking up one morning and say, ah, hell, I'm going to write. So you you have written, I mean, writing for school newspapers and college publications 
that's actually a great experience. You know, that's where you make all your mistakes and that's where you get good. So when did you actually start? When did you launch the blog and kind of your Facebook posts and your, your kind of daily presence? Sure. So in 2020, when the pandemic hit, um, not to get too sad, but my wife was, uh, she was, she was sick. She's better now. Um, so that really meant a few things. One, I was in the house or I was working. And when I was working um, during the pandemic, we kicked everybody out because I didn't want, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't want to get her sick. Um, so I was just working or home. And, you know, I had this idea that I wanted to write a blog for a while. It actually was called Will Trip for Food at one time where I thought, you know, I'll, it was kind of corny. And, uh, you know, I had gone on a bunch of trips. I'm the guy in my friend group that when we go somewhere, people ask me, what, what are we going to eat? And I kind of plan it out. We go on little trips. It's huge fun. I should, I would love to take you on one if you want to come. Yeah. One of and, these days. Uh, Where do you go? So now and I, you know, you're, I see that you've gone, you've, you've done quite a few stories about uh, uh, New Jersey places. You've gone to Philly a couple of times. Where else, where's, where have you gone? Yeah. So I'll, I'll go everywhere. I'll eventually go everywhere. The pandemic again, starting in 2020 really limited that. Mm. So I kind of, Looked at my backyard, and uh, I know you're a Philly guy. I'm, I was born in South Jersey until I was seven. And I moved up to North Jersey. If you're asking me Taylor Ham versus pork roll, I'm Taylor Ham every day. I'm a I'm a North Jersey guy, but all my sports teams and my love of Philly is strong. Okay. So I really hit Jersey and I hit Philly. Uh, I've been to Buffalo. I went to Buffalo for this tailgate in January because I heard that they were animals and they jumped through tables yeah. and they also. They they cook their food on this red pinto, and I had to see it. So I uh, I wrote a story about that. I've uh, taken the day off of work and, and driven to Utica, New York, which is a, a honestly a, a hidden gem. It's a food capital of the country, and uh, kind of drive for four hours, get four hours worth of food in, drive home, and uh, you do that all in one day. Work. Jesus, I do I, I do everything in one day. So uh, about a month and a half ago, I. I took off and drove to the Hamptons. I woke up real early and I, uh, I heard about Listen, this. I'm just going to stop you right there. I've worked in a company that had buildings on Long Island and I never went as far as the Hamptons. As far as I went was uh, Yapank, which I think is exit, like exit 68 of the LIE. And there is no good way to get from New Jersey to Long Island, except helicopter maybe. So if you went to the Hamptons, that had to be, Three and a half, four hours of driving. So it was three and a half there, four and a half coming back. I looked at a helicopter; it was eight hundred and fifty dollars, and I said, yeah. "That sounds that sounds good." Once I get some more, uh, you know, audience on my blog. But I left super early. I got there. I went there for one specific food. It was a clam pie that has been made by the Bonnickers or the Bonax for the last three hundred plus years. So. Mm -hmm. People out there, they don't they don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm like, no, that you can get this in East Hampton. I mean, you can only get it in East Hampton. So I drove out there, I made some phone calls, I made sure it was there. I went to a few couple places that made it. It was the best New England clam chowder and a pot pie crust you've ever had in your life. Oh, wow. So it, it was amazing. Um I've good. done the I've done the same thing though, where I've driven four hours and it was not amazing. The trip, the experience, I'll still take it. But, uh, you know, sometimes the food's not really worth it, but yeah. I need to, I need to make that trip to find out. Right. You don't know unless you go. I'm just, uh, the last, one of the last things or most recent things you posted on your Facebook page, which is also called Foodigenous, by the way, folks, it's spelled F O O D I G E N O U S Foodigenous. I saw that you did, um, you went to Philly. You were down at the Reading Terminal Market, which is one of the my most I'm from Philadelphia originally. So it's whenever I go there or whenever I can, I go to the Reading Terminal Market at all costs. And you, you posted a picture of a friend of yours eating this sandwich, which, uh, of course, I never heard of it. Roast pork greens and sharp provolone. And the look on her face is like, I'm not leaving here until I finish this sandwich. And you know what? She finished that whole sandwich before she left. That's exactly what it was. I took her and her husband. Um, that sandwich, which you've never heard of, was voted the number one sandwich in the country by this guy, Adam Richmond, about six years oh, ago. Yeah, I know Adam. I've uh, seen, his, seen his TV shows. So what is yeah. the sandwich called? What's it called? It's just a roast pork. I say greens because I couldn't remember if it was broccoli rabe or uh, mm. or spinach. It was I spinach, you. I think. And then, you know, Philly's 
sharp provolone. They have the best provolone in the country, in my opinion. Um, the sharpest provolone on any sandwich you get. If you go to and get a hoagie anywhere, and I said it like a Philly person, uh, yeah. if you get, a, um, get the sharp provolone. That was amazing. I wanted to ask you a question. I know this is your thing, so I'll, I'll be quick. But yeah, have, no you ever heard of, have you ever heard of pizzazz? No. So I wrote this story about pizzazz. I go to Philly a lot. I go to Philly's games. Eagles are my team. I'm in Philly a lot. And I stumbled across this local pizza, this local foodigenous, right? That is super popular in pizzerias within 15 blocks. But you go mm. on that 16th block and no one knows about it. And that's what really appeals to me. It's just a it's a pizza dough with American cheese, fresh cut tomatoes, and banana peppers. Wow. And it's phen- American phenomenal. cheese, huh? Yeah, it's phenomenal. Not just American cheese, like Cooper Sharp, which is a specific okay. regional cheese that I want people to read that and say, I want to, I want to eat that. You yeah, know, I yeah. It's not I a typical pizza, uh, pizza concoction, pizzas with, uh, you know, mozzarella and whatnot. And and where do you get it? Is there any one place you get it or is it? Well, so it's, it's actually, um, it was invented in 19 in the 1980s at a place called celebres and i would suggest going it's within the shadow of the stadiums but my favorite is at a bakery called kasha's bakery in philly as you probably know that i don't think the pizza is awesome i love philly food pizza is okay but the bakery pizza the, all the square tomato pie they might call it mm. uh they make it in square slices for a dollar which it's it's amazing you eat at room temp and you eat like six of them and you you don't realize (laughs) that's all right well i love that stuff more with adam horvath after a moment of shameless self-promotion the earth is dying a slow death the five thousand people living on the moon are in trouble Their paradise has become a cautionary tale of human weakness. We need a hero. Enter Rick Mack and the Planetary Commission to save the Earth, the Moon, and themselves. Moon Rescue Escape from the Dome by Tom Krantz. Now available in ebook, paperback, hardback, and audiobook. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about your writing. So you mentioned before your writing, you inject a lot of pop culture into your into your writing, but your writing is also very casual. When I read your blogs, I feel like we're having a conversation like we are kind of right now. It's there's not a lot of formality uh, and it's very conversational, which I find appealing. Is that a a style that you kind of worked on or do you just sit down at your computer and say, I'm just going to write and whatever comes out comes out? You know, I think I wanted to be, uh, I liked the idea of what you're doing, a podcast. I like talking with my friends. I think that, you know, when I, you know, when I talk about food and they're interested, I kind of wanted to have that same effect when I write it. So grammatically, I know sometimes I might not be using the perfect grammar, but that's with intention. And it really is to make it feel like you're on the other side of a conversation with me. So that is intentional. And I appreciate you noticing that because it's, it's something I try and do, and I definitely do shoehorn as much pop culture movie references as makes sense. I often delete a lot before that final draft goes out. Well, that's called editing, and that's what any good writer <laughs> does, right? right so exactly. um, when you started doing this during the pandemic and at a, at a kind of a down down part of your life <clears throat> in interviewing a lot of other writers that... <clears throat> They actually find inspiration in stuff like that, in kind of down times, maybe bad times uh, in their youth and their adulthood. Uh, Do you think you would have done it had there not been a pandemic and had your wife been a okay every minute? Or do you think you just would have done it regardless because it was in you? I mean, it was in me to do something, whether it was just going to be food trips and, and talk about it with my friends and put them on Facebook or uh, to actually write about them, I, I needed the time. So as much as I, I was working probably harder than I ever did during the pandemic, um, but I just had a lot of downtime and I had I had a need to get stuff out of me. So I mean, emotionally, you know, with what with my wife was going through, what the world was going through, I, I thought it was very cathartic. And mm. 
So I don't want to bore you, but in 2011, I had this idea to create a potato chip company. I called it Jersey flavored. I registered it. And the idea was to create potato chips that tasted like popular New Jersey foods. As you mentioned, I wrote about, I write about Jersey a lot because Jersey has a lot of indigenous foods. So I actually went about it and I started this little company. I did it after my nine to five. And, you know, I created a Texas wiener potato chips a Taylor ham. I did a wow. Greek diner salad. I even did <laughs> Zeppelin's. Um, sold them at farmer's markets and did them at little events. And it was just so inefficient. Um, that did you kind make of them? Thing, did you make yeah, them yourself? I literally did everything. I would go to the, there was a spice store in Westfield. I don't know if you recall it. And I would get all of these spices and say, I'm going to make the Texas wiener taste. I'd come home. I would make the, uh, the topping, you know, and uh, if I'd miss it, I'd run out, get some more cumin. And uh, yeah. So every, every Friday after work, I would take, I would, take probably 80 pounds of potatoes. We would hand cut them and fry them, season them, bag them with cool little bags. And I lost like $25,000 in this endeavor, (laughs) you know, and uh, fought with my, fought with my friend who I made my partner who really was supportive, but I just didn't have the, I didn't use my CFO acumen. I just used uh, someone saying, ah, this is a great idea. Let's do it. Um, So how long did you do that? How long did that last? I did it for about two years until I realized I was losing as much money as I was. And we got good write-ups too. Like I actually had Chef Central at the time asked if I could stock their shelves. Now, meanwhile, these were handmade. I had all of the proper, you know, certification, but I just didn't have the ability unless I was going to go to a co-packer to to stock a store. Mm. And, you know, part of what I'm doing now, I'm good. I'm an efficiency expert in a sense. And this was the least efficient thing I ever did. What it did was it filled that void of not working in a restaurant. Ten years later, during this pandemic, I had that void again. Mm. You know, and this in this writing, this blog did it. The reason I even said that was with this blog in 2020, I said, if I can't commit to writing, I'm not going to do it. So before I even started publishing my stuff, which was 2020. In September of 2020, I wrote 10 stories. So I had a pipeline. I also recognized that no one's going to read a food blogger, you know, food blogger that has no history. So I reached out to Jersey Bites, which is a local Jersey blog. And I asked, you know, if I could just write for free Mm. to get my street cred up. Sure. And uh, within, within like three weeks, I wrote two stories and I had the confidence that I needed. It made my, you know, foodiginous stories better. And I committed to, you know, by the time I launched in September, I had about 13 stories that I knew that every two weeks, at least I could post something while continuing to write. So now fast forward to almost two years later, I'm pretty much writing. I have maybe two stories that I could post, but I'm a better writer now. So when I go back and reread some of the things, you know, I'd probably change that, but I'm pretty much writing every week. I'm trying to get something out every two weeks, every 15 days. Yeah. So that dovetails into my next line of questioning, which is the actual mechanics of how you do it. Do you, so do you do a blog, do you do a post uh, every week, every two weeks? And how do you do it? Do you just decide you're going to sit down at your computer and do it right now and do it until it's done? Or do you come back to it and agonize over it for like a week? Or how does, how do you actually physically do that? I listened to one of your earlier podcasts today and you had made a comment about when you write something, then you walk away and you come back. And if it's trash, you throw it out. And if it's good, you keep writing. Um, I kind of do something like that, but very, but much smaller. Um, I will write a paragraph Mm -hmm. and I will walk away from that paragraph and I'll think about that. And then I'll hate it. I always hate it. And then I'll rewrite it. And if I have a paragraph that starts off well, then I'll say I can go ahead and, and do this. Um, and then I'll actually find the food. You know, mm-hmm. I, I sometimes write something before I I discover the food or go after the food. Like I, I, I'm very interested in mustard pizza. Are you familiar with mustard pie? I am not. <laughs> so mustard pizza is actually an indigenous food from Trenton, Mercer yeah. County, where again, back in the 80s, someone asked, I think it was a drunk someone, they asked the pizza guy to uh, put mustard on the pie. So this guy put mustard, he put sauce, he put cheese and and sausage and it hit. And so now if you go to Mercer County and you ask for a sausage pizza, you won't look, 
you won't be looked at the same way you would if you went to Fanwood <laughs> and asked the pizzeria. So that's interesting to me. So I have a paragraph already written for that. And now I'm going to go down and bring some friends and we're going to do a little, you know, pizza, mustard pizza tour. That's so, a, yeah. That, that remind your story about just writing a paragraph and kind of that's your jumping off point. The two blogs, uh, two podcasts ago, I interviewed a, uh, a young woman who's a singer, she found her talent late in life and she writes all her songs. And I said, how do you write a song? <clears throat> you know, nice, broad, stupid question. that's impossible to answer. And her answer was, I usually, I start with like a sentence, a phrase, a line, or something that is in my brain about something or someone. And I, I hold on to that line and I take it home with me or I take it to my guitar and I and I just kind of build on it. And I think that's a really interesting and fairly common, really good way to build writing. You know, you start small and you build on it. When I write my the novels that I write, I start, you know, I don't do an outline. I don't outline chapters. I basically start, I write it from beginning to end. And I start with a concept and you build on it. And I re remember seeing an, an interview with Stephen King where he talked about an author friend of his who did his, exactly the same thing. So um, what is what? Are you, what's ahead for you? Are you going to continue, uh, you know, globe trotting? Well, you know, northeast trotting and eating and <laughs> writing. And how much more can you eat before you burst? So I have to diet. I have uh, <laughs> I have definitely gained some weight. My wife reminds me. I the mirror reminds me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is a passion. So I have a few people now who uh, are like, you need to monetize this. I'm like, nah, I don't I don't want to. I think when I start thinking about making money, it becomes a job. And then I, I kind of maybe have a, a little bit more anxiety about it. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, I will be jumping off further. I have a trip. Um, I have a couple trips planned. I'm going to visit my sister in Georgia. So I'm going to hit a bunch of the places up. I'm probably going to hit my friend up in, in California. I've yet to go west of Oklahoma. Mm. Um, so I'm going to try and get as many places. I'm not going to drop every story in California in one shot, but when I'm there, I'll definitely get as much as I can. And then, uh, you know, listen, I, I'm a CFO. That's my job. I sometimes think I have to remind my boss so he doesn't get nervous that I'm leaving. I like this though. And this is fun. So I'm starting to get some people reach out to me and, you know, ask me to come to the opening of their restaurant. And I, I've been saying no, cause I'm not a review blog and I don't want to take advantage of people. Um, but you know, I'll say no thanks. And they're like, Hey, listen, we want you there. We, we want influencers. I'm like, I have a thousand Instagram followers. I'm not an influencer, but I'm continuing to try and build this audience. Cause I, I want people to be interested in what I'm writing because I want them to eat it, you know, and if I, I can continue you. to get a little bit better and, you know, well, make... if people are reaching out to you and they're saying, come, you should go. I mean, I think you've already, I mean, you've been doing this almost two years. Uh, you know, I, I mean, at what point do you say I've got cred and I don't have cred? Where's that line? You know, I mean, if you, anybody who goes to your blog, your website, or your Facebook page can see, you know, what you're talking about. You're a good writer. So say, yes, damn it. Take the damn food and write about it. That's what I would do. That's my sage it. advice for nothing. Again, the, um, the, the, your fate, your Facebook page is simply called foodigenous and your website, I think is, is it foodigenous.com? Yeah. Uh, do I have it? Yep. Foodigenous.com. Correct. Oh yeah. I bookmarked this story about the peanut butter, uh, bacon and jelly, fried peanut butter and jelly and bacon sandwich. Oh my God. I just started reading it and I, I'm not even sure I want to know whether or not you ate that sandwich. Don't tell me. I don't want you to spoil the end. Uh, Adam Horvath has been my guest. He's a blogger. And uh, as I said, check out his, uh, his blog, his Facebook page and his website. All those links will be in the uh, story info of this uh, podcast. Adam, thanks so much. I'll see you in family. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Who man, wants yeah. celery? I do. Who wants celery? It's good for you. <laughs> Delicious. Bye bye. Hi, folks. Tom Kranz here. I appreciate you tuning in to my podcast, Type Tune Tint, and I especially appreciate those of you who have subscribed. Uh, I started this subscriber thing in July of 2024, really just as a way of uh, recouping a little bit of the costs of doing this uh, podcast. There's website hosting and there's uh, WordPress editions, and occasionally I buy a book so that I can actually know what I'm talking about when I interview an author. 
Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast for as little as $3 a month. It comes off your credit card uh, automatically. And for $3 a month, you get the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping keep this uh, podcast going. I'm in my fifth year now. But also, I will occasionally offer exclusive content just for subscribers. So uh, give it a give it a shot. Um, I appreciate you taking the plunge. You can unsubscribe anytime you want. If you have any questions or comments, of course, you know how to get in touch. So please subscribe. And uh, I appreciate it. Thanks.